Welcome to the Good Chris Sophian Talks podcast. I'm Levi. And I'm Chris. Thank you so much for joining us this week. On this podcast, we select one talk a week to help each one of us get the Bible in our daily news feed. We post at the start of each week for you to listen with a short intro beforehand to kind of set the stage for the talk you're about to hear. And now, let's hear more about this week's talk. For our talk this week, we're listening to an evening program that was given at the Washon Bible School just this past year by Brother Nathan Lewis. The topic of his evening program is, How Fast Are You Running? And in this evening program, Brother Nathan is taking a look at the pace at which we are living our lives and how that the world is continually trying to increase the pace and the speed at which we do everything. He makes reference to a study that shows that Every year, things are getting faster by 10%, progressively everything from the the response times to when we need information to how quickly people expect information. The instant gratification that everybody's expecting now in, in the world is only ramping up as more and more time goes on. He starts in the beginning just by looking at some of the world events about how things are just starting to move faster and faster down a direction that to us looks and points to the signs of the return of Christ, but to the world just looks like things spiraling out of control, and then pivots from that to look at how a life lived in the world versus lived for God is so different. You know, talking about how that at work and at school, everything's supposed to be, you know, real fast, real quick, as quickly as you possibly can. This topic felt really pointing to me because it's been something I've been noticing more recently uh, as with work and family and everything going on that there just always seems to be more to do and you're trying to squeeze as much as you can into every spare moment you have. What I really appreciated about Nathan's class is the reminder that God wants us not to be going as fast as humanly possible to try to get everything in as quickly as we can and do as much as we can in the time allotted, but instead to stand still, to focus and be still, which allows you to focus on God and to be able to hear that still small voice inside you and understand what God is wanting you to do and to be able to live a life for him. And that life is one that takes meditation and contemplation and focus because when you're going super fast, you're going as quickly as you can, you're reacting, you're not thinking. And when you're reacting, then the reactions that are governing your decisions are not of God, they're of men, because our own instincts are fleshly, they're not spiritual. So I just felt this was a, in particular, for the point in my life that I'm at right now, was a really good reminder in the way that the world is going with, you know, companies making the transition to where it's less about whether or not you're in the office to work, but just that, you know, you're accessible and then you can work wherever you want, however you want. But that also means that that work is always at your fingertips and always accessible uh, is something that is only going to become more prevalent as time goes on. So it's a really enjoyable class, a really good lesson uh, and a good reminder that as the world kind of spins up and accelerates beyond that, it's important for us to step back and stand still and pause Uh, and consider to make sure that you are staying focused on the things of God and not just getting caught up in the the rat race that the rest of the world is in. So as always, if you have any suggestions for classes or topics that you think would be beneficial to share to everybody everybody else, please send them in, send them an email, or share them with us on our social media. And uh, thank you for all those that have already sent them in. And with that, we'll turn it over to Brother Nathan Lewis for his evening program titled, How Fast Are You Running? I want to look at uh, a little something tonight, a little theme from the scriptures, which I hope you'll find thought-provoking and exhortational. I don't think there's any doubt in the minds of any of us that we live in the end times, the time of the end, the time when Jesus Christ is about to return. There are signs in abundance that Christ is almost here. Israel's back in the land. We looked last night at the rise of anti-Semitism. Putin's making moves in Russia. There's Pope Francis's ecumenical croaking. 
uh, the uh, powers of Europe are getting together. Brexit and the UK getting out of the EU. These signs are plenty on every side. But what about us? What about us? What about something a little more personal in the way of signs of the times? What will the time of the end be like for us, the disciples? What do the scriptures have to tell us about those that are alive at the coming of Christ and what they'll have to contend with? And do you know, when you start sort of taking away Ezekiel 38 and Zechariah 14 and Revelation and the times of the end prophecies and ask yourself the question, what does the Bible have to say about what the truth will be like for us? There's not actually that many scriptures. There's things that we think might apply to us, maybe from Matthew chapter 24, but maybe have mostly an application to the disciples in AD 70. But there is a prophecy that talks just about our end time. And I'd like you to come there. It's Daniel in chapter 12. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. But thou, O Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. That's our time. We live, as we said, in the time of the end. For in the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So we're told here in Daniel chapter 12 that a characteristic of the age in which we live when Christ will return is that everything's going really fast. We seem to be told that we're going to live in a world stuck in fast forward. It's true, isn't it? We do. We live in a world that's obsessed with speed, with cramming more and more into less and less. And every day is like a race against the clock. We shouldn't be surprised, should we? Because Daniel said, many will run to and fro. This pantic, frantic pace of life is characteristic of our age. It's an, it's an age of speed. And so to make things better, we speed them up. You think about it. We used to have food. Now we have fast food. We used to dial. Now we speed dial. We used to read. Now we speed read. We used to walk. Now we speed walk. We used to date. Well, people used to date. Now people speed date. Kids used to have braces, now they have speed braces. We used to cook, now we have Jamie Oliver's 10-minute meals. In America, a few years ago at McDonald's, if you didn't get your order under 60 seconds, it was called the 60-second challenge, it was free. Normal fast food was not even fast enough. Instant gratification was almost too slow. Do you know, in 2003, a Texan man was, giving a speed, was given a speeding ticket for speeding in a hundred kilometers an hour zone. Now he was not going a hundred kilometers or 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers. He was going 389 kilometers an hour. That's the age in which we live. 200 years ago, the fastest you could go was on the back of a horse. Do you agree? Now, NASA's scramjet does 11,265 kilometers an hour. That's about three kilometers a second. If you traveled from Ontario to here, as Brother Dan did, 4,000 uh, kilometers, you could do that in about 20 minutes. The age in which we live is an age of unprecedented speed. Now, Professor Richard Wiseman from the UK did a very interesting study, an international study in 2007, where he established that the average walking pace of your average person on the street was a pretty good indicator on the pace of life, a pretty reliable measurement. And he had data from 1994 and he compared it to fresh data that he took in different cities around the world 
in 2007. And do you know what he found? Globally, in just 13 years, the pace of life had increased 10%. In Singapore, it increased 30%. You just think about that, brothers and sisters and young people. In 10 years, you are doing everything 10% faster. That's just amazing. It's incredible. We used to conform to nature's timetable. We went to bed when it got dark. We got up when it got light. We ate more when there was plentiful food in the summer and in the winter. We shrunk and got smaller and everything seemed to work. With the industrial age, now we can stay up later. We can work longer. We can work harder. We can shop later. With the technology and an internet revolution, the pace of life has just gone up again. We can have instant messaging, messaging, where we're contactable every hour of the day. We feel frazzled. We feel disconnected from nature's pace. Here's some statistics for you. 36% of people right now are feeling rushed all the time. 60% of meals are rushed or hurried. 40% of Americans are doing the job of two people right now. 47% of people are finding that they have difficulty trying to take time off. Almost half the people working in America, they want to take time off, not allowed, work harder. People are going to the dentist to have a break. I mean, what is happening, brothers and sisters? I mean, this is a beautiful thing. It's good for business, but it's telling us something, isn't it? It's telling us something. In a study of 550 people on the speed of life, 50% of them admitted to driving through red lights. 60% decided to use the car instead of take a short walk. 75% of people would rather hang up than stay on hold. And 84% of people admitted to walking on the escalators just to gain an extra couple of seconds. If statistics send you to sleep, then how about this one? 37% of Americans in 2005 admitted to falling asleep at the wheel. 37%. That's 103 million Americans in 2005 fell asleep sometime in the year at the wheel. Why is this happening? People are feeling overwhelmed. The pace of life is too much. You're driving and you're just so tired, you fall asleep. And actually the amazing thing is that 13% of those people that admitted to doing it once in the year admitted that they did it probably once a month. Something's happening out there, brothers and sisters. The world that we live in wants to go faster and faster, and faster. And we need to recognize that that pace of life is toxic to the truth. We have to recalibrate. Somehow, we have to disconnect and slow down. Because in the headlong dash of daily life, it's very easy to lose sight of the damage that this does to our life, to our lives in the truth. We're so marinated in this culture of speed that we fail to to notice the toll that it's taking on our lives, our spiritual lives. We find that we're hurrying through our day rather than living each day for God. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why not a single country in the world decides to increase their top speed limit of 100 kilometers an hour Every year, just by like 2%. Like inflation happens, your taxes go up. How about next year, it's 102 kilometers an hour. And then it's 104. Why doesn't this happen? We know why this doesn't happen, brothers and sisters. Because beyond a certain point, a certain speed, reliably things start to go wrong. They start to go bad. And so it is in life when we go too fast. Our mistakes go up. Our irritability goes up. And all of the good things of life, our productivity, our morale, our energy, our excellence, our care for others, 
our joy, they all go down. So many of the things that affect godliness. This is a serious issue. The faster we rush, the further we inevitably seem to fall behind. And we develop all the symptoms of people who are going too fast. We're frustrated, we withdraw, we're apathetic, we're depressed. And if you feel, brothers and sisters and young people, like your life is stuck on fast forward, then maybe we all need to reclaim some margin in our lives and recover some emotional energy for God. So what, is the scriptures, what do the scriptures have to tell us about these things? Well, tonight I just want to look at one simple idea, and it's actually the opposite of speed. It's the opposite of running, and it's God's solution. It's called standing still. I'd like you to come back to Exodus in chapter 5. What's God's solution to running frantically to and fro, to a frenetic pace of life? Well, look, let's just start here tonight in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 10. This is our life. We're in bondage to Pharaoh. And the taskmasters of the people went out, verse 10 of Exodus 5, and their officers. And they spake to the people, saying, Thus saith Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go ye, get you straw from where you can find it, yet not aught of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw, and the taskmasters hasted them, saying, Fulfill your works, your daily tasks, as when there was straw. This is the world. Pressure. Work harder, faster, longer. We're in bondage to this system. Sound familiar? Does it sound anything like our lives? More bricks with less straw? Ever feel the sting of the Egyptian whip on your back, making bricks for Pharaoh, working harder and faster and longer with less and for less? This is our lives. We are in bondage. But thankfully, God has a solution for us. And we know this story pretty well. The Israelites are working faster and faster and faster, making bricks. And God, in his mercy, brings the ten plagues that decimate the land of Egypt. Until at last, Pharaoh is broken. And look what it says in chapter 12, in verse 33. Finally, after ten plagues, Pharaoh's spirit is broken. And Exodus 12, in verse 33, says... And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we are all dead men. So they're working faster and faster. The Egyptians are urgent to get them out of Egypt as fast as they can. In fact, they partake of the Passover, standing up so that they're ready to flee as soon as they get the word. There's not even time to leaven their bread in verse 39. And as soon as Pharaoh relents, they run to the edge of the Red Sea. Pharaoh's roaring up behind them. And look what we read in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. Stand still. God has an important lesson to teach his people. Before they are baptized in the Red Sea, they are impressed with the fact that in the journey of going from Egypt to the promised land, from slaves to sons, we have to slow down, slow down, slow down until we stand still. And then we can see God's salvation. Can you imagine it, young people, especially? You've got Pharaoh behind you with all his army, a hill on this side, a hill on this side. All your instincts are screaming out, run! And God's command is, stand still. It's totally counterintuitive. 
But you see, when we stand still, we can see something. We can see something that we could never see while we were running. And that is God's perspective. While we are running with them, we're not standing still with God. It's a matter of relativity. If we are moving, we can't see it for what it is. And it's only when we slow down, and we stop completely and stand still, that we can see the Egyptians for what they really are. It's actually exactly what they said they were in chapter 12 and verse 33. Dead men. That's all they are. Dead men running straight into the middle of the Red Sea. That's who they are. That's the world. Here today, seen today, gone tomorrow. This is God's salvation. This is the truth that we can see as soon as we stand still. We can see things from God's perspective. And did you know that standing still is a theme that runs all the way through the scriptures? Standing still and seeing God's salvation. Here's just a few which we won't look at, but just to illustrate the point. This is a very pervasive idea. You can look them up in your own time. Think of Gideon and his 300 men. We're told that it's when they stood every man in his place. Rotherham's has when they stood still. That the Midianites ran and shouted and fled and attacked each other. It was when they blew their trumpets and stood still that the Midianites who had enslaved Israel in cruel bondage ran down the valley of Jordan towards the fords of Jordan to perish in a watery grave in Judges chapter 7. Exactly the same. Or what about Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 and verse 17 when he's faced with the great multitude of the Moabites and Ammonites and he said, stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. And the enemy killed each other till the last man was dead. What about Hezekiah? Being still, as he says in Psalm 46, verse 10, as God destroyed Sennacherib and the Assyrian army in a night, they were all dead corpses. What about from our story this week? Haman, he's hasted to the battle of doom and Esther stands still before the king. It's the same word in Esther 5, verses 1 and 2. It's all through the scriptures. It's Ruth the Moabites. It's Shema, the mighty man, defeating the Philistines. It's the Ethiopian eunuch. It's all about standing still, brothers and sisters. That's when we see God's salvation. We see that God is able to save. And the Israelites were impressed with this lesson as they left Egypt behind. And as they looked back at the Red Sea, empty. The Assyrians, which they saw yesterday, gone in the night. They would never forget this lesson. It's when we stand still, we can see God's salvation. Except the only problem is that we do actually forget. Now, if you fast forward 40 years, the people of Israel, the next generation, were going to have to be impressed with exactly the same lesson before they entered the promised land. Come across to Joshua in chapter 3. You'd think that once would be enough, wouldn't you? By the Red Sea, so dramatic. All of the Egyptian army drowned in a moment because you just stood still. But just 40 years later, everybody has forgotten. And Joshua 3, the nation is going to have to be impressed with the same lesson again. It's a different time. A different group of people, maybe, different place, but the same lesson. Joshua 3 and verse 7. Yahweh said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, like I was with Moses on the shores of the Red Sea, so will I be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall... 
stand still in Jordan. And verse 14 says, And it came to pass, when the people were removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as they that bear the Ark were come into Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the Ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho on dry land, just like the Red Sea. Before them stood the Jordan River, the descender, the stream of humanity that goes all the way from the Sea of Life in Galilee, down, down, down to the Red Sea, to the Dead Sea, I should say. And we're told specifically in verse 15 that it is not a gentle, meandering brook. It is a swollen, raging torrent. It's swift and deadly. It's fast and lethal. It's a picture of humanity, flooded, overflowing, rushing headlong, down, down, down towards death. There's people in that river going 389 kilometers an hour straight into the Dead Sea. And the lesson is exactly the same as Exodus 14 and the shores of the Red Sea. If we want to cross that raging torrent to enter the promised land, around 2,000 years or 2,000 cubits after our Lord in verse 4, the Ark of the Covenant If we want to gain entrance to the kingdom across this torrent of humanity, rushing headlong towards death and oblivion, we have to stand still. And it's then, and only then, that we can see the world for what it is and see God's salvation, the Ark of the Covenant of God's presence amongst his people, rolling water uphill pushing the relentless tide of humanity back all the way to Adam, verse 16. This is the salvation of God. It's his blueprint for salvation, for redemption from the headlong rush towards death. His answer to this frightening dash of dead men and women towards the grave is to stand still and see Yahoshua's salvation, the ark, our Lord Jesus Christ, who can stem the tide, reverse the curse, push back death. I'd like you to come to Luke in chapter 7. Into a marvelous little parable inside a real life story. Luke chapter 7 and the story of the widow of Nain's son. See how our Lord Jesus Christ understood this principle, this story of Exodus 14 and Joshua chapter 3. Luke chapter 7 and verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain. And many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. He came and touched the bier. And they that bear him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise! And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet has risen up among us, and that God has 
visited his people. It's exactly the same picture, isn't it? A huge procession of people, much people of the city. In type, it's the whole world. The tide of humanity marching behind a coffin. Just like the children of Israel at the shores of the Jordan, marching behind Joseph's coffin. But look what our Lord does. He recognizes in this weeping woman, this widow, a picture of his own mother, mourning for the death of her only special son. And he's moved with compassion. And just like the ark in Joshua chapter 3, he steps forward into the swollen torrent of humanity, flowing inexorably towards death, and he halts the procession of death. They that bear him stood still. They were confronted, weren't they, by the ark that could compel waters to flow uphill and life to come out of death. And Yah's salvation, Yahoshua was seen. He was seen when people stood still. And the coffin was discarded. The torrent of death stopped. Here was the one who one day will roll the waters all the way back to Adam. And so in the headlong dash of daily life, what is the lesson for us? The frantic pace of life. Many running to and fro. When we find ourselves running, running, running. When life seems to be getting too fast. What is the lesson? What I'd like you to come back to 2nd of Kings in chapter 5. In 2nd of Kings chapter 5, we have, as we all know, the story of Naaman. We know it well. And as great, and as mighty, and as honorable a man as as Naaman was in verse 1, he had leprosy. What's he doing, brothers and sisters, and young people? He's rushing, headlong through life, straight towards the Dead Sea, and he has leprosy. He's moving faster than most. A terrible disease. He knew he had little time left. And in 2nd of Kings chapter 5, there are three men. And they tell us a gripping and a sobering story with a powerful lesson for us. Firstly, there is Elisha, the man of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ in type, our example And look how he's described in verse 16. And he said, As Yahweh liveth before whom I stand. He stands still before God. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, in the story, we have Naaman rushing headlong towards a watery grave. And he humbles himself. In the Jordan, the very place where the waters were rolled back in Joshua 3, it's the same scene. He humbles himself to wash his sins away and emerges clean. He sees the power of the God that saves. God's salvation is the meaning of Elisha's name. And he goes from being a man who's rushing headlong towards death to a man, in verse 15, standing still. Before Elisha. He stood still before Elisha. So Elisha's standing still. Naaman was running, running, running. Now he's cured, healed, transformed. He stands still before Elisha. But lastly, and more chillingly, we have Gehazi. And look what Gehazi does in verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, 
my master hath spared Naaman this Syrian in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as Yahweh liveth, I will... Uh Uh-oh. Run after him and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come unto me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content. Take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bare them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go and they departed. And he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou? Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither? And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee? When the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments, olive yards and vineyards, sheep, oxen, men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. And unto thy seed forever. And he went out of his presence a leper as white as snow. And the lesson of this story is the tragic end of a man who pretended to be amongst those who stood still before Yahweh, but in his heart, as well as in real life, he wasn't standing still, he was running running after the things of this life, money, status, clothes. He ran after all the things that Naaman had when he was rushing headlong towards the grave. The things that Naaman wanted to give away now because he knew they couldn't save him. He pretended to stand still, but actually he was running. And the leprosy that Naaman washed off in the Jordan, by standing still and seeing Yahweh's salvation, this man received. It's like Naaman hopped out of the Jordan and Gehazi hopped right in. The Jordan is a swift and lethal river. And the lesson for us, brothers and sisters and young people, is that it's when we take the time to stand still to step aside from the relentless surge of humanity that we can see God's perspective. And when we stand still, we can see just how fast that river flows to death. And we can see how pitiful the Naamans of this world are, caught in its tide. I'd like you to come to First of Peter in chapter 4. And let's learn the lesson of Gehazi together. The man who ran instead of standing still. First of Peter 4 and verse 1. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein... They think it's strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Do you know that word excess in verse 4 is the Greek word 
anacusis. It means overflowing flood. Rotherham's translates it, an overflow of riotous excess. The New King James has a flood of dissipation. We live in a world that is flooded, overflowing its banks, obsessed with speed. We all know it's going too fast. Many are running to and fro. But Peter says in verse 4, it's a question of whether we are running with them. Are we? Are we? How fast are you running? Are we swept up in this frantic race to the finish line of the Dead Sea? Guilty of being overwhelmed by the pace of life? Guilty of being like Gehazi, running with them instead of hopping out, of hopping in? The Jordan brothers and sisters is flowing faster than ever. In fact, it's 10% quicker now than it was just 13 years ago. And it's affecting us, isn't it? It's the danger of being swept away. Out of a life of godliness in the truth. We seem to have less and less time for God, for our readings, for hospitality. We feel burnt out. We feel exhausted. You probably have had this experience when you come to Bible school and you say, ah, long time no see, how are you? Ah, I'm exhausted, flat out, busy. It's been mental, right? This is what we say. It's like we need a break. We're perpetually running. And when we get a break, we get a night off, we don't even really know what to do with ourselves. And suddenly we find we almost don't know how to slow down. We don't know how to stand still. Speed can be a way of walling ourselves off from the deeper things of life. We fill our heads and our lives with distractions, busyness, important stuff. So that we are so busy, we never have to ask, how is my spiritual health? How is my godliness? How is my hospitality? We can always allow ourselves to run so fast that we never have time to ask the question of verse 1, do I have the mind of Christ that has ceased from sin, ceased from running? This is the danger of the frenetic pace of the age in which we live. So what is the answer? What can we do? What must we do? What I'd like you to come in conclusion to Psalm 23. These are the words of a man who was an absolute master of being still. A master of finding time for God. Psalm 23 in verse 1. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. In the margin the waters of quietness. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So there there are the swift waters of Jordan, dangerous and lethal, seeking to claim our souls in its impatient currents. And then there are the still waters, the waters of quietness, the waters that can restore our soul. We need to have moments of standing still with God. Moments of deceleration. Moments of peace and quiet. I want you to ask yourself this question. When was the last time that you took just 10 minutes to do nothing? just to think of God's salvation, his kingdom. Just 10 minutes. 
just 10 minutes of stillness. When was the last time? It's extraordinary, isn't it? How terrible we are at doing this. Restoring our soul by the still waters. So here's my suggestion. It's a little practical idea so that each day we can have moments of standing still. Time to restore our souls. We all know that we need to do it, but how do we make it happen? It's got to be something that's simple and something that's achievable. If I say unto you, you need to do one hour of meditation every day, chances are none of you will do it and neither will I. It's got to be something that we can make happen. Let's think about what we've said so far. We've described the Jordan River as a picture of the world. Overflowing, swift, the torrent of humanity rushing headlong towards oblivion in the Dead Sea. And in our days, the time of the end, it's rushing faster and faster. It wants to suck us in. And it's only when we stand still, we step aside from the relentless tide of humanity that we can see God's perspective. But God's perspective on what? And the answer is that when we stand still, we see God's perspective on time. Because if the Jordan is overflowing with people, rushing, running, desperate to cram everything they can into 70 short years before they end up in the Dead Sea, then what are the still waters? Except they be people who they don't have to rush anywhere. They're detached from time. They're on God's time. They know that in God's plan, they're going to live forever. See verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. See the difference? Everyone in the Jordan River is cramming everything they can into 70 short years, but the people by the waters of quietness, their perspective on time is forever. There's no need to rush. There's plenty, plenty of time. We don't need to run, brothers and sisters. We have eternity. In fact, the kingdom only comes to those who have learned to stop running and to stand still, to see the world through God's eyes, to see just how fast each pitiful life races towards death when contrasted with forever. The difference between the torrent of Jordan and the still waters is God's perspective on time. So here's my idea. When life is too fast, how do we learn the secret of standing still? Why don't you choose a clock, just one clock, or a watch, somewhere at home or somewhere at work, but something that you regularly use, a clock that you always look at, and I want you to set it 10 minutes fast. This is now God's time. It's 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Now, it might make you do two, one of two things. You might end up being early and less rushed, which would be good. Or you might look at the time and think, oh, that's right. I have 10 minutes and you have some time to recalculate, to ask yourself in that little 10 minute window, how fast am I running today? How fast is the Jordan River flowing in my life today? Am I on God's time or the world's time? And if we need time to recalibrate for God, to take a few minutes to stand still, we can. It's God's 10 minutes. It's his time. We won't even be late. We can give it to him. We can create moments of stillness, moments in each day where we have the luxury of standing still by the waters of quietness, relating ourselves to eternal 
things, to be people who have time for God, people who have learnt in the busy, frantic age in which we live at the time of the end to stand still. It's an art that we must practice. This is God's solution. So when we feel like the taskmasters are flogging us and we're working harder and faster and longer making bricks for Pharaoh, let's take 10 minutes to stand still. When the roaring, swollen torrent of the Jordan River stands between us and the promised land, let's remember that our Lord has gone before 2,000 years ago and all he asks us to do is to stand still. And a way will be made open. When we feel like we're swept away into the world's inevitable procession of death, let's remember that our Lord Jesus Christ has bidden our coffins to stand still. Here's an amazing thought, brothers and sisters and young people. Do you know what standing still is? It is an absolute privilege. It's a privilege to stand still. It's a privilege that only we have. The world is running to and fro, frantic activity. The angels, we're told in Zechariah 4 and verse 10, also run to and fro, frantic activity. And amongst all of this, we are bidden, pleaded with, begged by our Heavenly Father, to just stand still and see his salvation. Let's respond in our lives. Let's reclaim some time, some margin for God, that when our Lord comes, we aren't hopping into Jordan, but we're hopping out. We are restoring our souls by still waters and looking forward above all things to dwelling in the house of our God, Thank you for listening to the Good Christadelphian Talks podcast. Please subscribe for new episodes and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever service you are listening from to help people find the show when they search for it. If you enjoyed this talk, share it on social media so other people can find it too. For show notes and links to the talk that you just listened to, visit our show page at anchor.fm slash gct. We want to encourage everyone to share their thoughts from the talk this week on Facebook or Instagram, where we are at Good Christadelphian Talks or on Twitter, where we are at GCT underscore podcast. If you know of a great talk, we want to know about it too. Send a suggestion to goodchristadelphiantalks at gmail.com or message us on any of our social media platforms. Thank you for listening. God bless and talk to you next week.